Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. What if you could get a bunch of people you don't know to put up all the money you need for your real estate investments? Well, they're calling that crowdfunding, and there's news in that arena. We've got a great guest to share it with you today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. All aboard! Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 14th Annual Investor Summit at Sea. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year are sales legend Tom Hopkins, international developer Beth Clifford, attorneys Mauricio Raoul and Jeffrey Verdon, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. New for this year, commercial mortgage broker and syndicator Michael Becker, personal development icon Kyle Wilson, and Ken McElroy's partner Ross McAllister. And joining us live and in person for his third Investor Summit, Robert Kiyosaki. It all begins February 26, 2016 in Miami, Florida. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to learn more and reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys and an all-star faculty on the 14th Annual Investor Summit at Sea. Memphis, Tennessee is a market that delivers in more ways than one. As home to FedEx, Memphis is one of the largest distribution hubs in the world. That means working class jobs. No wonder Memphis is one of the best cash flow real estate markets in America. And the guy in Memphis who can deliver great affordable cash flow turnkey properties is Terry Kerr at Mid-South Home Buyers. Contact Terry through the resource section at realestateguysradio.com. And be sure to order Terry's Tips for Turnkey Rental Property Investing. It's free. Just send your request to turnkey at realestateguysradio.com. That's turnkey at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. I'm Robert Helms, your host, along with our co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. It is the most wonderful time of the year. Yes, it is. We are uh, rounding down the year 2015 and off to uh, the new year, which we're always excited about. Oh, and, man. Uh, after Thanksgiving, I think I'm kind of rounding out. Definitely. <laughs> Round is a shape, and I'm definitely in shape. Uh, in fact, our real estate trivia question, not jumping too far ahead, has something to do with that very topic, Perfect. and it's related to real estate, if you can believe that. Uh, but uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, there has uh, just been some news at the actually the very end of October uh, about the SEC finally adopting the new rules for the part of crowdfunding, Title Three of crowdfunding, that allows uh, little guys and gals to invest in all kinds of new stuff. And so just to bring everyone up to speed, no investor left behind, uh, let's talk about crowdfunding. The basic concept is it's more, really more of a technology platform than anything else. But the basic notion is that you can raise money from the crowd. Hence the name crowdfunding, brilliant name. And it really supposes that you have a crowd. So the first order of business is to have a crowd. A lot of people are throwing these things up there just thinking, hey, if we put it up there, people will come. But there's rules involved. There's always been rules involved in raising money before technology ever came into existence in the space. It was really just a matter of making sure that investments were uh, suitable, if you will. And they had to put that responsibility on somebody. So if you wanted to go put money in somebody's safekeeping, you know, and someone was going to turn a business into doing that, they, they called that a bank and that was regulated, right? If you wanted to be in the insurance business and you wanted to pool money and then go out there and cover people for risks, that was a financial business covered under insurance laws. Well, if you wanted to go out there and raise money uh, and then invest it on other people's behalf, then that was regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission and uh, laws regulating the, the rules by which you could do that. And most of them were that you could only do business with people that you knew, right? You had to have a pre-existing relationship. There had to be some basis. You just couldn't go raise money from a bunch of strangers. It was designed, presumably, to protect people from guys just going out there and hustling. You know, just uh, just conning people. Of course, not that it didn't stop people from doing that, because right. like with most laws, you know, criminals don't obey them. They just do what they want to do. But at least if you get caught doing something like that, then the, the legal system has grounds to come in and shut you down. Well, so in the Jobs Act a few years back, which was a fancy acronym for creating jobs, uh, the government decided that it would be a good idea because the banks and credit had basically seized up in the financial crisis to loosen things up so that the money would be be able to flow more quickly from people who had it to people who could put it to work. And so inside of this legislation, there was a lot of different stuff, but there was a component of it that was going to open it up to where you could raise money from people that you did not have a pre-existing relationship with. And they divided those 
groups of people into two categories. One was accredited investors who've always been treated differently. Uh, and that basically is if you have a million dollar net worth, make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year as an individual or over three hundred thousand dollars a year as a couple. Uh, and that's consistent, meaning it's happened for the last couple of years and you have reasonable expectancy of doing it in the upcoming year, then you're qualified as accredited under the law. And that means that if I'm out there and I'm a purveyor of some type of an investment opportunity, I can run an ad and stick you in a room and pitch you my deal. And if you say yes, you can put the money in. And now I'm compliant with the law. And that was a big, big game changer. We've written a report on that. We've been talking about that for quite a while. And we've covered conferences of crowdfunding, and there's been big anticipation of this whole thing. Let's step back for a minute. Crowdfunding started as a non-economic participation model, meaning there were crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter, probably the best known one, but there's several of them where an independent rock band or an artist could go out and raise money for their next show or recording or whatever it is, and individuals could put that money up, typically via websites, and get something in return that was non-monetary. I couldn't get a return on my investment, but I could get a t-shirt from the band or an autographed CD. So crowdfunding has been around even longer than the Jobs Act. But the idea of saying, well, what if I put up money and wanted a return? Well, that all of a sudden becomes a security. It's regulated by the SEC. Well, it depends on if it becomes a security because there's there's the equity side and there's the debt side, right? So like peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms like um, Prosper and uh, there's a couple other ones out there like that. But these, these are platforms where people say, hey, I want to borrow some money and so you can invest in my debt. Um, you're going to loan me some money and I'm going to go do whatever I'm going to do with it and then I pay you back. That was kind of the next level where these, these securities and exchange laws really come into play more strictly are in the equity side when yes. you're going to be an owner in the company or you're going to be an owner uh, in in the entity if you will that's where they had divided people up to accredited presumably you were sophisticated and could afford the risk and then non-accredited meant that you were underneath that million dollar net worth threshold or you were underneath that two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollar earning threshold which most people are by the way which most people are that's where the bulk of people are so you know those people have had to go into the publicly traded securities arena by stocks bonds Much mutual safer. funds yeah <laughs> yeah i mean just whatever i mean we could go off on that but the, the the point is these types of investments were really for insiders and they weren't available for the little guy to get involved in well this latest iteration of the jobs act which is really uh, the way it works is is congress passes a law it's a statute and then they turn it over to the bureaucrats who are the people who have to actually implement the law and they create what are called regulations well in this particular case this was a law called the jobs act that created a statute that made this permissible more uh, than two years ago according to congress and then it got turned over to the sec whose job it was to create the regulations that everybody would use to follow that so the first set of regulations that came out with was in september of 2013 about how you could do this for accredited investors well the latest and greatest now, here we are in uh, late 2015, is that now the regulations have come out. So how does the game get played when you're going to make an offering to non-accredited investors, which arguably is a lot bigger market. So we're going to find out about that today. Absolutely. And it's good news, but it also is brand new. And so when the first part of this came out and accredited investors could now be prospected by these various folks raising money, we call them promoters or syndicators, someone who's looking to raise capital from somebody, it opened up this new world of opportunity. And we have a report on that, and it's been a big topic of conversation in Real Estate Guys circles. To get your copy of the report, just send an email to monopoly at realestateguysradio.com, or you can visit the special reports section in our resource center at realestateguysradio.com. The big change now is the fact that there are a lot more rules and there are companies that have been in position for this to happen for months and months and months and in fact years. And finally, we're going to see where it all lays. Now, even though we've had since 2013 all the regulations for the accredited investors, as you probably heard on our Halloween Horror Stories episode, attorney Marisa Raul recounted the fact that one of his clients who used these exact rules and went out and prospected and got people in a room got contacted by the state saying, hey, you, you know, there's been a complaint. So my point in that is, even though it becomes law, it doesn't mean that it's evident yet. 
So in real estate circles, the uh, term LLC, the concept of an entity called a limited liability company has just been kicking around for a long time. It's pretty ubiquitous. Everybody knows about it. Most people use it. The LLCs didn't exist in the 90s, right? right? It was like the late 90s, like 97 or something, LLCs really started to come out. And the problem with a lot of attorneys back in the beginning were not willing to recommend it. They still recommended corporations or trusts. Why? Because there was a whole lot more established case law. Somebody's got to be the pioneer. Somebody's got to go out and take the new law and then try it out and then figure out how the the courts are really going to interpret it when there becomes a conflict. And that's because the way our system of law is, it isn't so much what the law says, it's really, you know, what the law was intended. And that leaves some room for interpretation. And that's where a lot of people get hung up. So when you go into your attorney and you're asking them for legal advice, it's harder for them to give it to you because they don't have court precedents to look at. As this progresses and the pioneers go out and pave the way, what will happen is more and more of this will become more clear. In fact, one of the reasons we think that we've gotten these regulations finally from the SEC for the non-accredited, which is arguably the little guy they're trying harder to protect than the big guy, is because they rolled out the regulations with the big guys a couple years ago, and they really have had very few problems. Right. Because of that, they you know presumably feel safer. Hey, let's go ahead and roll it out for the little guys now too. Or maybe it just takes two extra years to write those few extra lines of regulations. I don't know. That could be as well. Our guest today is attorney Maurice Arold. He's a practicing attorney licensed in California, but he does a lot of consultation with folks who are raising capital. In fact, he's one of our featured speakers at our syndication events. We come back. Marisa will fill us in on the latest with crowdfunding. Today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Are you ready to profit in paradise? Hi, it's Robert Helms. And if you think real estate investing means tenants, toilets, and termites, think again. Located just a short plane ride from the U.S., a virtually untouched paradise awaits. The beautiful country of Belize. When you go to Belize with the Real Estate Guys, you'll spend four fabulous days discovering one of the most intriguing real estate markets I've ever seen. With its jungle rainforests, pristine beaches, and 81-degree turquoise water, Belize is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Plus, it's considered one of the top seven tax havens in the world. Belize property is on the rise, and many experts think the best is yet to come. But don't just take my word for it. Come experience Belize firsthand at our upcoming investor field trip. When you join us, you'll discover the many reasons we love Belize, like tremendously undervalued beachfront land, super low taxes, ease of doing business, and so much more. Get the details at realestateguysradio.com. Just click on events. See paradise for yourself. Click events at realestateguysradio.com, and I'll see you in beautiful Belize. Hi, this is Patrick from Paradigm Life. I've recently written an ebook called The Perpetual Wealth Strategy. The ebook discusses one of the best investments, real estate, combined with a financial vehicle used by the wealthy, many US presidents, famous actors, athletes, and even Houdini himself. You can download the ebook for free in the resources section on the Real Estate Guys Radio homepage. Don't wait, go download it now. Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki. I'm the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And if you're serious about learning how to invest in real estate, listen to the Real Estate Guys. They really know what they're talking about. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. We're talking today about the new changes in the ability to raise capital through crowdfunding. Joining us now, our good friend and attorney, Mauricio Raul. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Robert. Thanks for having me back. Well, absolutely. Been waiting to do this show until the rules were finally set. And for listeners that didn't hear the show, probably our first show was a couple of years ago when this was announced that all of a sudden the rules are changing in terms of the ability to raise money and there were a couple different ways to go about crowdfunding. But of course, like anything that is actually law, it's taken a long time for the government to finally give us what the rules are. So paint the picture of that. Where are we in the process of feeling like we know what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we've been talking about this forever. Um, this started, just to kind of take a step back, this started back in April of 2012. Wow. I mean, we've been talking about this for almost three and a half years. Wow. Uh, and this is the, the infamous Jobs Act. In that act, essentially, there was two new ways of raising capital. One was uh, allowing people to advertise and generally solicit uh, the syndication that you were doing. They Which lift, is they... a big one, because previously you couldn't do that. You couldn't have any public display. You couldn't go out and advertise, promote. You couldn't put ads in the paper. You couldn't do any of that in a private placement. Absolutely. And that was one of the big restrictions that we had. And so that lifting of that ban was a huge, huge uh, new rule for, for us investors. 
The only caveat with that, of course, was that you had to limit your investors to accredited investors only, and you had to take some reasonable steps to verify that they were uh, accredited. So that was good, uh, and that took a couple years to to implement. Or actually, not not so much two years. It's been in the books now for a couple of years. Uh, but this new one with the crowdfunding sort of addresses that gap, which even though now you can advertise and solicit to accredited investors, you still can't do it for non-accredited investors. And this law was meant to address that gap. And accreditation, uh, no investor left behind. Most of the folks listening understand that. But if you don't, it just means that there is a financial re- requirement for you to be able to invest. And accredited rules change all the time, but it has to do with how much income a person makes and what their net worth is. And you can find that out by Googling around. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you real quick because it does it does apply somewhat to what we're going to talk about. So accredited investors, if you make over a $200,000 a year for the last couple of years, then you're accredited. Or if you have over a million dollars in net worth exclusive of your personal residence. Okay, so that's the And again, these things do change. So make sure depending on when you listen to this, that uh, that's still the rule. But the idea is if I've earned that much money or I make that much money, then the government feels that I've earned the right to make my own investment decisions. If I'm not accredited and I haven't uh, amassed a net worth of a million dollars separate from my house and I don't make $200,000 a year, then obviously I can't make my own financial decision. I need some help. And so to protect the folks out there from being fleeced by these promoters, these are the rules. Like it or not, that doesn't matter. The reality is I could make the argument that you're going to be a lot more fleeced in the stock market or in bonds or in whatever other pyramid scheme the government has going on. But it doesn't matter. These are the rules. And the thinking behind it is the more sophisticated an investor is probably has some parallel to how much money they have made or make. Yeah. And there's a lot of controversy as to whether that's a good uh, measuring stick. Uh, but that's exactly right. If you really, if you're non-accredited, then the law assumes you're not sophisticated and therefore you have a requirement to provide additional disclosures to these investors because again, they assume that they're, they're not quite sophisticated. All right. So now we knew kind of what the framework of this looked like, but the actual law hadn't been written. We didn't have the concrete parameters we can go after. And it's my understanding that we now do. We do. It actually happened uh, October 30th, so on Halloween or just before Halloween. Uh, and again, it's been three and a half years in the making uh, because even though the the laws are passed at some uh, three and a half years ago, they require that the um, Securities and Exchange, Exchange Commission, the SEC, actually make some rules. So the law is a little bit broad, a little bit vague, and so now somebody has to actually go and actually make the specific rules. And that's uh, we didn't think it was going to take three and a half years. They were actually mandated to do it within six months, but uh, they obviously didn't listen, and it took a while. <laughs> it took longer. The government took longer. That's amazing. It's amazing, right? All right. So now the good news is we have these rules. Now, this doesn't mean, those of you raising money for real estate projects, that you can now go out and assault people to invest. There still are some rules and parameters, and the way that this money gets raised has also been dictated. Let's talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, I, I'm going to talk very general here because uh, the actual rule is 685 pages. Wow. So, so it's got some complexity into it, but I think I've, I've sort of narrowed it down to really three important points that I want I want to discuss. Uh, the first one is that you are, like you mentioned, you can't just go out and start you know raising money on your own. You have to use what's called an intermediary, which essentially is a website. They call it a portal that is approved by the SEC. Now, we've already seen these kinds of websites out there. And of course, there's been websites for traditional crowdfunding, which isn't economically based. It's, I'm going to you know, put some money in to support my friend's independent film or recording project or whatever. But now the idea is it's not necessarily vetted or sanctioned, but the website is this portal, this particular venue to accumulate these types of investors as well as these types of projects. Yeah, and they're going to be vetted pretty heavily by the SEC. They're, you're going to have financial disclosures. They're going to have to show that you're able to do this. But uh, you're not allowed to go set it up on your own. Um, it's not like the other crowdfunding that we've heard about now with, with the accredited investors that we just talked about where you could set up your own website and, and advertise your deal. Here you have to go through this portal and all you can do really is point to the portal. So in your advertising, you can say, hey, I've got a deal. It's in this particular portal. Go check it out over there. Uh, and then the investor would have to go to the portal, open up an account with them, and then go through the process. And the point is, these portals, uh, and again, anticipating this law being finalized, these have been in the works for years. But the idea is there's two membership bases of this. There's the the membership of the investors, individual investors who want to see deals. And then there's the promoters, the syndicators that have deals to put up there. And both sides have to become vetted, if you will, for, from the portal. 
Right, and the portal is going to have all kinds of educational material, obviously information about the syndication itself, which was most likely going to be provided by the, the sponsor. But the investor is going to have uh, a lot of information available to them prior to making their investment decision. So let's talk about the parameters of an investment. Because these are non-accredited investors, there's also rules about how much they can invest. Yeah, there's actually two main rules. One is the amount of money that you as the sponsor can raise through these portals. Okay, so if I'm out there doing a real estate deal and I want to raise money, I've got a maximum. Your maximum is $1 million for any 12 month period. Okay. So I could do two deals at 500,000 each? You can do two deals at 500,000 each. It's an aggregate amount of how much money you raise over that 12 month period. Okay. So while we're on that topic, here's a quick question. Say I'm raising $2 million and I have a buddy putting in a million. Can I raise the other million this way or is it just the project can be a maximum of a million dollars? There's nothing that prevents you from still raising money sort of in a parallel course where you can raise a million dollars from this new crowd. I'm going to call it regulated uh, crowdfunding, because that's what the SEC is calling. So the regulated crowdfunding, you can raise a million dollars, but that doesn't prevent you that if you can find an another exemption, you can raise another million or five million or ten million through another uh, existing exemption to registration. But the one that relies on this particular law limits you to the million dollars through this process. Okay. So what about the investor side? What's their limitation? It depends on how much money they make or how much net worth they have. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit different than the accredited investors. The cutoff is essentially $100,000. If you earn $100,000 or less, or you have net worth of $100,000 or less, yep. then you are limited to either $2,000 or 5% of the lowest of those two numbers. I'll let you do the math, but that's the restriction. Okay. I think most people will fit into that $2,000 number based on those numbers, but that's the limitation number one. Now, there are scenarios where you really could be an accredited investor, for example. You could be a doctor or a lawyer making $200,000 a year, but because of student loans, because of whatever other decisions you've made, your net worth might be $80,000. Right. So even though you're an accredited investor, you're going to be limited to 5% of that $80,000 because that's your that's your lower amount. Using a portal, you wouldn't have that same limitation if you were just investing as a doctor or a lawyer that had good income but lower net worth. That's correct. Using the portal, which again, it goes back to my prior point that if you have accredited investors, then you you may be able to rely on another exemption in order to raise additional funds and not really be part of this $1 million tranche, let's call it. So let's say this $2,000 number, if that's the amount, is that again per deal or per year? It's aggregate through the 12 months. Okay. So you can invest two, up to $2,000 across the board, 10 different deals at, I guess, $200. <laughs> All right. So $2,000 for the investor, a million dollars for the promoter. As you can tell, this is why the real estate guys have not held this out as the end-all, be-all for syndication, because most of the deals people eventually do are going to be bigger than that. And frankly, having done this for a long time, raising capital, raising $2,000 from a person, that might be the most expensive money you ever took in terms of their sophistication, the questions they have, dealing with communication, all that. I would much rather have 10 guys at 100,000 than 100 guys at a couple thousand, right? Right. And that's, I think, one of the, the big challenges is you end up, if you're going to raise half a million or a million dollars, you end up with, you know, 100 people or 150 investors that you have to now regularly communicate with. And, and if things aren't going great, they're going to have more, more people that are upset. But let's not forget what happens if you have more than $100,000 in income or okay. a net worth in, in excess of 100,000. But not yet accredited. But not yet accredited. Then your limitation is 10% of either your net worth or your income, whatever's lowest. Okay. Okay. With, and the big caveat, with a cap, a complete cap of $100,000. So if you're an investor who's got $10 million in net worth and makes $5 million a year, you're not going to be able to invest $500,000. Your cap is going to be $100,000 per 12-month period. So let's talk about the kind of deals then that make sense for this. Obviously, if I'm raising money to go buy a $60,000 house that's a rental property, that, that might work, this might work perfectly well for that. And I'll be able to stay within my limit. I could do 10 of those a year and still be within my limit. I could take investors with a thousand or, or fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars, and that could be a great way to play. So this definitely serves a need. It's just not right, the right tool for everybody. It's also great, I think, if you're raising money for a lending facility, if you're trying to raise money that then in turn loans money and can give, you can give yourself a sort of a, a consistent rate of return. 
No, I think this is this. This also fits in, in part of your overall strategy, right? I mean, again, this this limitation is just for this particular exemption. So again, you could raise. Let's say you're doing a deal that you need two and a half million dollars. Well, a million of it can come from this regulated crowdfunding, and yep. then the other million and a half can be done through our traditional raises that we're doing today, either with accredited investors only or or through the pre-existing relationship. All right, good stuff. We're talking with attorney Marisa Arold about crowdfunding and the new requirements. We'll continue our discussion when we come back. Plus, we'll play real estate trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Are you achieving everything you want in life? What if there was a time-tested way for you to get everything you've dreamed of? The most successful people in life set goals and keep themselves accountable. But how? The good news is that it's not rocket science. You too can learn the skills and unleash the motivation that will create success in your life. And now is the time. Hi, this is Robert Helms, and I'd like to personally invite you to attend Creating Your Future, the 2016 Goals Retreat, taking place January 8th through 10th in beautiful San Diego, California. This unique weekend has been called phenomenal, inspirational, and life-changing by the hundreds of people that have attended. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com and click events or call 888-489-7723, extension 18. Get your life back on track physically, spiritually, and financially. Attend the 2016 Goals Retreat on the second weekend of the new year. Click events at realestateguysradio.com and register why there's still early bird pricing. This is no dress rehearsal. Live the life you were meant to. Visit realestateguysradio.com or call 888-489-7723 today. Hi, I'm Mark Victor Hans. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. If you want to expand your consciousness, expand your wealth, expand your future, and have more delight and excite in your future than in your past, keep listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. We're talking this week about the new changes and their good ones that have to do with crowdfunding and non-accredited investors. Before we get back to our interview with Mauricio Raoul, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia, your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question. In just a minute, I'm going to give you a question that has something to do with eating a lot of food and real estate. As soon as you hear the question and think you want to take a guess, send us your answer to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. The first person with the correct guess will win a copy of Second Chance, the latest book by Robert Kiyosaki. Before we give you this week's question, last week it was Ask the Guys All Your Great Questions. Our question was this, in what city was the first parking meter installed? Well, I guess it wasn't that hard to figure out. Lots of folks guessed Oklahoma City. That was back in 1935. All right, so this one's harder. We just went through Thanksgiving, upcoming Christmas, and lots of family get-togethers, and Hanukkah, and New Year's, and reasons for you get together and eat. So here's my trivia question for today. In what part of the world was the fork invented? Where, you know, real estate, where was the fork invented? If you know or want to take a guess, and let's all be happy that it was, then all you have to do is send us an email to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name and your physical mailing address plus the answer to the question so that if you're the winner, we can send you a copy of Second Chance by Robert Kiyosaki. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking about crowdfunding, specifically Title III crowdfunding, which is the new part that we've just finally gotten some clarity on, which is going to non-accredited investors through a portal and raising a smaller amount towards a smaller amount, but still a lot of tools here. So, you know, we use the vernacular, Mauricio, of the person who's doing the deal as the syndicator, or sometimes we call that person the sponsor or the promoter. In the regulations, they're referring to this person as an issuer? Right. That's the legal term as an issuer, the person who's issuing or the company that's issuing the security. So let's talk about the issuer. What requirements do they have? If I'm doing a deal and I want to go to one of these portals and say, hey, put my deal up, what does that look like? It also depends on how much money they're raising. Okay. Uh, they, they're really focusing on these limitations. So it depends on how much you're raising. If you're raising less than $100,000 in your syndication, then all you need is a statement from your chief financial officer saying, here, here are my financials. And I basically the CFO gets to provide them and you're good. Okay. 
If you're raising between $100,000 and $500,000, then you have to have your financials reviewed by an independent CPA. Okay. If you are raising more than $500,000, then you are going to need audited financials. Which are also expensive to get. I mean, getting a CPA to, to take a look, that's going to cost you something. Audited financials are a whole can of worms. It's a whole new can of worms, and it's uh, usually a little bit pricey, depending on you know how big your company is and how much. But your CPA literally goes through every single line item and requests receipts and makes sure that you know if you said it was a dollar, they make they confirm it's a dollar. So right. there's, there's some expense there. Uh, and then there are some uh, general annual f- uh, reporting requirements that the issuer needs to make every year, just letting them know how the syndication, how the, how the project's going and updating their financial information. Which is good practice anyway, right? What we tend to do when we raise money for a project is we do either a quarterly report or could be a monthly report if it's a very fast-moving deal. Could just be an annual report if it's right. something like a long-term land bank, but you're going to report anyway, so it makes sense that that's there. Is there any scrutiny on the financials of the person involved, not just to say my company is a company raising money to buy rental houses, but what about me, my credit, my past history, any of that kind of stuff? This is all dependent on the company that you're issuing. So a lot of times a company already exists, right? If you're if you're Microsoft and you want to go raise another, you know, $10 billion or something, that's an, it's an existing company, you're already a startup. Um, so that's one type of issuer that would require financials. Then there's others where you literally start a brand new company, right? It's a it's a real estate deal. It's a deal specific uh, thing. And so in those situations, there really aren't any financials to provide because it's a brand new company. Yep. And as long as it's not a way for you to get around the financial requirements, you don't just create a shell company in order to avoid your real company. But if it's truly a new company, then there really aren't any financials to provide. And finally, there's going to be some disclosure requirements that uh, the issuer is going to have to make about their deal, okay. which nobody should be surprised about. That's what we do today. The difference is that the level of disclosures is not going to be anywhere near the type of disclosures we make now through private placement memorandums, right? Okay, so that's an important point. If I'm raising money through a portal, that means I don't have to complete a full private placement memorandum? Right. You just have to make, you still have to make disclosures, but they're not going to be to the level of the disclosures that we typically make in a PPM, which essentially are the same disclosures you make if you're going to register your security, which are very detailed. Right. And think about this from the investor's point of view. They're going to want to know the deal. So you're going to have what we might call an executive summary. Uh, just here's the deal. Here's the parameters. Here's the market. Here's the property. Here's our best guesses about you know cost or here's the existing cost, all that stuff. And then you're going to have these disclosures which say, hey, you can lose money in real estate and here are some of the risks and, and those kinds of things. Are those disclosures in that executive summary, those are reviewed by the portal too to make sure they pass muster? Yeah, I mean, th- these are all things we don't know yet because obviously these portals haven't uh, even been created yet. But yes, I'm going to imagine that the portal is going to want to review and vet the deal themselves just from an exposure and liability standpoint, right? I mean, they're going to want to make sure that this is not a fraudulent uh, deal. I'm not sure how in-depth and detailed they're going to review it, but they are going to have a review process and you're going to have to convince a portal that your deal is is good enough and, and legitimate enough to be on their site. Well, and I guess as an investor, I'm going to choose a portal that I feel comfortable is doing that work for me, but I also am going to have my own level of due diligence. Let's take it from that point of view. Say you have an investor who's a client and they go, hey, Mauricio, I'm looking at putting $2,000 into this particular deal. Is there a reason or a place for my counsel to review a deal before I invest like it would typically be? Or do you get the feeling that, hey, the portals handle all that? No, I wouldn't rely on the portals. Again, and it's not clear on what level of scrutiny the portals are going to do. But if a client comes to me uh, and wants me to review the deal, I'm, I'm going to go through the disclosures and er- any information that's been provided to the client and point out whatever deficiencies or red flags that I see. And, and I wouldn't necessarily rely on the portal. I'm not sure you're going to be entitled to rely on the portal. So I would I would do your own due diligence if I was the investor investing the money. You're just looking forward and already talking to a couple of the folks who are putting these portals together. There's going to be a lot more, right? If you just go and look at any possible URL name that has crowdfunding in it, it's been taken for years, right? People have already been anticipating this. And I'm going to guess that we're going to start to see personalities come out for these portals. They're going to focus on certain niches or even geographies and things like that. So it's going to be incumbent upon the investor to make sure that the kinds of deals that they're interested in are being provided. And I'm going to assume that either one side or the other, and it's probably the issuer, is going to pay a fee to the portal, uh, maybe both sides. Any idea about any of that? Well, I, I, I've seen some noise about a concern that the amount that they're going to be charging, the portals are going to be charging. Again, we don't know what they're going to be charging because they don't exist yet, but it may hinder your ability to raise small amounts. I mean, if you're going to raise $100,000 and your portal is going to charge you, you know, 15%, 
then that's probably going to mess up with your numbers. And so, again, it's all speculation. Uh, none of the portals exist. In fact, the registration for portals doesn't begin until the end of January. Okay. Um, and one thing I probably should have mentioned at the beginning, even though the good news is that this is now law, there's still a six-month wait period before it becomes effective. Ah, so okay. it won't actually become effective till I think, uh, May 21st. I think it's the date. May 21st of next year is when you're actually going to be legally allowed to do this. Uh, so there is a six six month uh, window that we've got to wait still. All right. Well, between now and then, you're going to be with us at the Secrets of Successful Syndication in January in Arizona, and I know we're going to talk more about crowdfunding this time because of that. We are going to uh, focus a lot of the time this time on on crowdfunding, and uh, because we, you know, now that it's final, we know what it is, and and we'll we'll spend quite a bit of time with it. Last couple of uh, events, you've been talking about, hey, it's coming, it's coming. So this is uh, great on uh, that account. Now, for those of you who are driving or exercising or any of that kind of stuff and you weren't taking notes, Mauricio has prepared a report. What he's done is gone through the 600 plus pages and, and distilled it down. So what's in the report? The report essentially is a is a summary of the 685 pages. So I've kind of tried to translate it into English, number one, uh, which is very technical. Yep. And second of all, I put together a report that essentially gives my top good, bad, and ugly of the report, okay. uh, of the new rule. So you, you can kind of get my thoughts on that. And then I think what I'm going to do as well is, is because there are a lot of questions about the, uh, the new rules, I'm going to be holding a, a Q and A for anybody who's interested, probably an hour, um, sometime at the beginning of next year. So that if you've got specific questions about it, um, you can, you can ask me. And so I encourage you to get the report because that way you can get on my list and I can, I can send you the invite. Perfect. So that's how it's going to work. Uh, before we're done today, we'll tell you how you get your hands on the report. And that'll also get you alerted when, uh, Marisha does this live Q and A session. So if you have specific questions, and there's going to be lots of questions as this thing rolls out, but uh, exciting stuff. All right. Just to be clear, we've been talking about this new part of Title III, which allows us to raise money to non-accredited it is for lesser amounts. But for a while already, the regulations were out about the accredited places people go. And whether you call them portals or not, there have been some websites. We've actually had guests from some of those sites uh, on the program raising money for accredited. So that already is up and running. And that's a pretty vibrant part of uh, crowdfunding right now. Yeah. And, and there's a, there was also a lot of confusion. I mean, everybody calls everything crowdfunding, but there was a distinction. I, and I was distinguishing it between the little C and the big C, but now I'm going to call it the regulated uh, crowdfunding. But uh, the crowdfunding that already existed was this I'm going to get technical. It was the 506C exemption, which allows you to advertise to accredited investors. And that's been going around now for just over two years. It was yep. September of last year. Uh, what this is, it's a separate, completely new exemption that specifically talks about the portals and what we've been talking about today. But uh, it is a brand new law that, again, technically doesn't even go into effect until May of next year. All right, good stuff. Well, as always, Counselor, thanks for your uh, great insight, and we'll see you at the Secrets of Successful Syndication in January. Thanks for having me. All right, there's attorney Maurice Arold. When we come back, we'll have more about crowdfunding and its potential right here on the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. When the housing market crashed in 2008, San Antonio led the way in appreciation and cash flow. Would you like to have a strong, reliable investment that performs in both up and down markets? Cash flow is the key to successful investing and we have tons of positive cash flow properties for our ATW investors. Come see why the Milken Institute rated San Antonio the number one economy in the United States and why San Antonio is the only major city in the country to have a AAA bond rating. ATW Investments can teach you strategies for building strong, secure wealth 
with investments starting at $5,000. ATW's patented, proven, and powerful system will do all the hard work for you. ATW is where the perfect market meets the perfect strategy and produces the perfect results in your portfolio. To get started, go to the resource section of the Real Estate Guys website or email us at contact at atw-investments.com. Hi, I'm Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Listen up. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this great radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com or your favorite podcast venues. We're talking today about the changes and finally the final legislation, if you will, the rules that we can live by as potential crowdfunders and uh, good stuff from Mauricio. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's easy to get lost in the weeds, but that's why you have advisors. That's why you engage people who pay attention to these things on a tactical level because ultimately you know just saying hey i can go do this you still need to make sure that whatever you're planning on doing is strictly compliant and so you always want to make sure you have those guys and gals on your team who can help you do that but conceptually it's very exciting because the idea is now we are beginning to take down some of the barriers and you know you can say what you want and everybody has an opinion and i'm, I'm certainly one of those people with an opinion about you know the role of government and what they do and what they don't do uh, in this particular case government is getting out of the way i mean it's not it's not like they're saying oh you can go do something that you weren't able to do before i mean technically what they're doing is they're saying hey we erected a big barrier and now we're going to lower the barrier so more people can get over it but at the end of the day look at it from whichever perspective you will the bottom line is it's a good thing that at least the government is beginning to recognize that we've got to get capital flowing and there are people who just absolutely want to be able to invest with a person that they know or Main Street. There's other people that want to invest with a professional advisor. But there's more and more people that are engaging in building social communities online. And this is, um, I think, a, a real opportunity, especially for the next generation. Right? You and I, Robert, a couple of, a couple of older guys, right? <laughs> Speak for yourself, <laughs> and uh, my older co-host friend. Yeah, so you know, the, but you know, you look at the way the younger generation is just growing up. I mean, I have children that were born before there was an internet. I have a couple who can remember before there was an internet, and then I have children who have no concept or memory of life before the internet. They only know a world with the internet in it. They've yeah. never seen an encyclopedia or a telephone book. They don't understand what those things are. It's not where you go to get information. And a big part of their social life is online. I mean, watch these guys, they get on Instagram or whatever, and you know, they start talking about something, and next thing you know, a, a month later, they've got 5,000 people following them. I'm like, gosh, it took us forever to get up to 5,000 people people following us, but you know, they understand that world. It's a natural progression in a social environment for people to share things, including opportunities. Right. And, you know, so when people have an opportunity and people have money, the technology, the, the online world, the community is a natural place for people to do that. And it's inevitable that at some point, again, you know, you can say whether it's good or bad, but at some point the government is going to get involved beginning to try to regulate some of that. And in this case, they're trying to unleash the power of the online community, the internet, to be able to connect people and get money flowing. So I think ultimately it will be a good thing. It's just going to take some pioneering and Thank God there's people out there that are willing to go out into the wilderness and try something new and uh, really looking forward to seeing how this uh, new innovation progresses. Right. And keep in mind, as Mauricio said, that the big difference, one of the big differences here is that the only way you can, as a promoter, as a syndicator, go after the non-accredited through crowdfunding is via an approved portal. You can't just start your own website and raise money or go to eBay. You, you've got to go. Well, you can, but it. Probably not a good idea. Well, right? Right, okay, you, you can't <laughs> right? legally. I mean, you know, I can. You I, want to go to jail. I can go out and rob a bank if I want to, right. but I don't suppose that's a good plan. So, so you, the, your plan will be to vet these platforms, and certain ones will appear. In fact, coming up at the Secrets of Successful Syndication, we'll have an update on who's in the game and what's happening. Again, we don't have any horse in the race. We aren't affiliated with any of these platforms. There's lots of them vying for our attention right now. We thought it best at this point, rather than come up with you know. Any kind of recommendation or list that we just alert you to the fact that this is happening so it gets on your radar but as we go through the next year we'll see a lot of these folks are putting serious intellect and capital behind these platforms expecting this will be a way that people who haven't up until now perhaps even invested in real estate be interested in investing in things like real estate well I mean think about it think about think of, if you're old enough to remember life before amazon.com right there was many many people uh, I, I went my very first internet marketing seminar was about 
about Galaxy Mall. I went and saw the Galaxy Mall presentation. And that was the first time I ever heard the word portal and began to understand that there were going to be places online, these virtual places that people could enter into a whole world of shopping or whatever. And nobody hears about Galaxy Mall today, right? It's all Amazon. So, you know, all of these innovative companies are out there. Somebody is hoping to be the last one or two or three, four people standing. I mean, Amazon and retail, online retail is by far and away the dominant force, just like Walmart and Costco are the two dominant forces in retail. Now, right? depending on when you're listening to the archive, that may no longer be true. I know that may no longer be true. <laughs> but, you know, so watch the space. And as we're going to be watching the space, because probably over time, somebody's going to be emerging as the person who's dominant. You have to ask yourself, well, what is the main value proposition? Well, you know, the, one of the main value propositions is they're going to have to be compliant, right? You're going to have to make sure that they've done a good job vetting the uh, people and following the, the regulations that they have to follow in terms of their responsibility, allowing people to come in and, uh, and show you what they have to offer. But the other big part of it is they're going to have to have a crowd, right? I mean, because if you put your offering out there and nobody's got any eyeballs, and what good is it going to do? Well, this is one of the big common misperceptions, and you talked about this early in the show, but there was a lot of folks two years ago and three years ago when crowdfunding was just starting to stick its head up and say, hey, we may be able to have equity-based crowdfunding, who thought, thank goodness, it's the end-all be-all. I'll just throw up my property on some website, people will overbid for it, and it'll be done. The reality is it's not about the technology. It's always about the deal. If you have a deal with a good story and it's been vetted and it's been inspected and all that's been done, then finding the capital now has changed for some folks to be able to go to methodology like crowdfunding. But unless there's a crowd, there is no deal. So a lot of what these portals have to do is develop that following, that crowd, those people who are going to be looking at like peer-to-peer -peer lending, right? A lot more people borrowing money than there are lending money on peer-to-peer -peer lending. So what's it going to shape out for crowdfunding? Right now, we've already seen what's happened to accredited. There's several big reputable sites that have the ability for accredited investors to register, be shown deals, and invest. And it's working pretty well. This is very different because of the level of complexity. I'm guessing the level of deal size is going to be different. Probably not as sophisticated as, uh, of investors get, getting involved. So it's brand new territory, but it'll be exciting to watch. I think the other thing that you've got, you know, is just realizing, and you know, we do a lot of stuff online. Obviously, we, we appreciate guys. We put our, you know, we do our radio show, of course, and we put our podcast out there and we do our email blasts and newsletter blogs and all that. And people come out to our live events and, you know, we're able to meet them and that's exciting. The number of people that come out into the live event is a small, small percentage of people that actually uh, engage with us or, or hear our voices or, you know, read our stuff online. Uh, and that's always going to be the case. But in terms of our business and the people who end up becoming the most valuable to us and our sponsors, if you will, are going to be the people that come to the live events, right? So you still have to deal with the fact that this is a people business and technology, you know, is going to open up the number of people you can communicate with. But you still on your side of it, and we're not talking about the crowdfunding side of it, but you as the individual person out there thinking, hey, I want to use a crowdfunding platform, make sure that you've put some time and thought into how you're going to handle the customer service side of it and all the interaction that you're going to have. Uh, with those people as well, because just, just getting the money in is only the beginning of the relationship. It isn't the end, right? You've got a lot of responsibilities once you've got an investor into your whatever it is you're offering to continue to build that relationship. And so make sure that you've uh, contemplated that. And as you're evaluating different crowdfunding platforms that you might choose to engage with, look at them through the whole thing. I mean, how are they bringing people eyeballs in? How are they vetting deals? How um, are they uh, communicating? What type of added value services are they going to provide you after the fact uh, in terms of uh, supporting your, your customers and how all that works? There's, there's still a lot of things yet to be developed. Continue to watch the space. We're going to continue to watch the space and we'll bring you more news as we, uh, as we hear it. Crowdfunding is one of the potential ways to raise money for deals. If you're out of your own cash and credit and want to go raise investors' equity to do more deals and get bigger, faster, well, come on out to the secrets of successful syndication. We'll be in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona the last weekend of January. Now, the only way we could do an event this time of year is if it was not a football playoff weekend. So it's the weekend between the last playoffs and the Super Bowl. Come on out. Ken McElroy will be there, syndicator extraordinaire and the Rich Dad Advisor for Real Estate Investing. Mauricio Rold, who are here on the program today, will be out there. And we've got a bunch of great, great faculty members and guests. It's always wonderful, the people that show up to the event. Uh, but it won't be the same without you. So get to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click events to come out to the secrets of successful syndication. 
Big thanks to Mauricio for uh, his time and uh, research. If you want a copy of his report, he's uh, basically put a synopsis together of all of this new information so you can read through it easily and he'll give you a link to the full thing if you really want to read all of it. All you have to do is send us an email to fund the crowd at realestateguysradio.com. Yep, just send an email to fund the crowd at realestateguysradio.com and you'll get Mauricio's synopsis of everything you heard today. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki, and I'm very excited that I'll be joining the real estate guys for their investor real estate summit at sea. Join me, join my friends, join the real estate guys investor summit at sea, and I'll see you out there. Thank you very much. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.